I, I guess I would start by doing what other speakers have done. I'd like to thank the chairman of this meeting for inviting me. <laughs> I want to speak about the fourth phase of water. And I show this slide uh, not only because our university is a very beautiful university, but I'm talking about the fourth phase of water. And this slide shows very nicely the three phases that we all learn about. It shows a nice water fountain liquid, it shows the snow solid on Mount Rainier, and it shows the clouds in the sky showing the vapor. So, so it's a good place to start. We started, in fact, uh, with the book that I wrote 12 years ago, Sam Jails and the Engines of Life. And in that book, we, we I, whatever, talked about the role of water in biology and health. And it was really a starter. This is what got us going. And it, it started with the ideas of Gilbert Lane about ordered water next to proteins and other macromolecules inside the cell. And so we knew from his work uh, that the water was ordered next to these surfaces, but we didn't know too much about it. We knew uh, that it extended in multi-layers, maybe more than the two or three molecular layers that the textbook talked about. And we also knew that this is kind of ordering or crystal-like water excluded solutes and particles profoundly. And so with, with that solute exclusion in, in mind, Luckily, it came upon a preparation that allowed us to explore the properties of, of this water. And it was really simple. It came from uh, a Japanese colleague. And uh, it started with a gel. And you put the gel into a chamber. You can see the gel at the left. And you added to that chamber water and particles. And we had the idea that, that by examining this in the microscope, we could detect the region over which the particles were excluded, and we would assume perhaps that that would be the region of the extent of the water structure. So we did the experiment, and we found, uh, astonishingly to our surprise, we found that the particles, we used microspheres, little spheres, uh, kept moving and moving and moving. They got expelled from a really large region, a region on the order of 50 micrometers, which was too huge to imagine that it could be true. Uh, but we began seeing it again and again, uh, and we called it the exclusion zone, or EZ for short, and easy to remember. So another example of that is, is shown here. We use this quite a lot of piece of napping on you see. It's a polymer. Uh, it's a highly charged polymer. It comes in sheets, and we take sheets, and we just cut any size we like, lay it down in the chamber. We add microspheres uh, in, in the water, and we watch what happens. It see the same thing happens. The exclusion zone grows and grows, and it grows to the point, uh, typically, this is stopped prematurely, it can grow out to 400 micrometers, 500, that is half a millimeter. It's typical, and you can see it with your naked eye, you don't really need a microscope to see it. Well, many people have taken up this experiment and have demonstrated that the exclusion zone, they can repeat the, the exclusion zone phenomenon, but the question is, what does it mean? Does it really mean the ordering of water out to those extreme lengths or what? So, what I want to do is answer a few questions, and I'll do this quickly because I know that some of you have seen this before, some have. Is the phenomenon of exclusion general, or just those two examples I gave? Does it really arise from the ordering of water, which excludes the particles? It's a lot of ordering. Can water ordering explain the various anomalies that we know about in water? And since you need energy to create order, uh, where does the energy come from to create this? And might the ordered water paradigm relate to health? The question of generality, I'll just summarize. Uh, we've tried many materials, many surfaces, gels, polymers, biological surfaces, and even monolayers, single molecular layers, and we found exclusion on a regular basis. So it's pretty general. And what's excluded from it? Well, we've tried solutes ranging, uh, particles uh, ranging from tens of micrometers in size down to molecules 100 uh, daltons and, and lower. And I just want to give you one example of the 100 uh, molecular weight 100, it's, it's a pH sensitive dyes. And these dyes are a mixture of five or six different chemicals, 
different substances, molecular weight, uh, approximately typically 100 or so, and I'll show you in the next slide how these are excluded from the exclusion zone. So what you see is a nicely colored slide, and if you ignore the pretty colors and just focus on the piece of napkin sitting at the bottom of the chamber, all we did was to add, <laughs> add water and pH sensitive dye. And what you can see immediately above the nafion is the exclusion zone, and there's no dye. Uh, we know there's no dye because it's color, it's colorless, color free. And, and so that implies that the molecules on the order of 100 or so are excluded. We think smaller. We have some evidence that even salts may be excluded. Now, the colors are interesting because according to their particular dye, uh, the red color corresponds to a very low pH, that is pH 3 or lower. So a lot of protons are sitting there and fewer are farther away and so on. We'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes because I think it's a really important finding. But to summarize the first point about generality, many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones and many solutes are excluded. Okay, question two, is the zone really physically distinct from bulk water? Um, now, we have eight categories of evidence, and if I went through each one of those, it would take up the whole hour, so, and many of you have story is markedly different from what I presented to you. Okay, and, and one of the important aspects is what happens when you have multiple molecules or particles so let's say they're both negatively charged, and I've shown here, put it in the water, and they're near each other, so they feel one another, and what happens to the distance between them? Well, you might surmise that the distance will increase because they're near each other, and they feel each other's repulsive force, but in fact, the distance decreases. And this is not new, this is known for a hundred years, and uh, Feynman uh, coined the term like likes like, uh, and what he means is that the two like charges like each other, so they come closer together because if you like one another, you, you, you do that. It's, it's kind of a, kind of the opposite of what you see here, uh, where these uh, warring parties, of course, stay as far away from one another as possible, unless the right object <laughs> appears in between them. This story actually is it's not original. It comes from the tale of Genji, uh, the first novel uh, in Japan from 1200 or something like that. I don't remember exactly. So anyway, they come together, and when do they stop? Uh, well, remember, we have all of these positive charges here, and the reason they attracted one another to begin with is that these positive charges created an attractive force, pulling this one and pulling this one. So they come closer together. <coughs> However, when they get closer, you have a repulsive force between the two negatives. And so, when the attractive force equals the repulsive force, you get stability. And this is an example of when you have many particles together. It's called a color crystal. It's been well studied, especially by Yorio Isa in Japan. And it's very well known that the yogurt that you had for breakfast this morning may be characterized by this, this kind of structure. And the particles stick together because of like, like, like. I think this principle is so important that it may extend from cosmological levels down to the structure of the atom, even. It's also important in biology for self-assembly because, think about it, all you need is water, particles, and light. They automatically come together. You don't need any fancy chaperone molecules or what have you. It also applies in clouds. The negatively charged droplets come together, obviously, to form clouds. But they shouldn't, because they're like charged. They should repel each other, it's what we learn in physics. But that doesn't happen, they come together. And I think the reason they come together is that the atmosphere is filled with positive charge. If you have enough positive charge, the, uh, the aerosol vesicles negatively charged will come together because of those positive charges forming the cloud. And if you have some additional positive charges here and some additional vesicles out here, uh, they'll be drawn in to grow bigger and bigger clouds. And that's why sometimes over a body of water you may get a single cloud or isolated clouds. But it doesn't make sense because the water is evaporating from everywhere. But the light 
Christ-like principle that explain why that happens. Okay, now we go to biology, and uh, does biology use the radiant energy that, that we receive? Well, um, I'd first like to talk about large scale. Obviously, we're receiving energy from all over. We're absorbing light energy, uh, infrared, and ultraviolet, and other kinds of energy as well. And so, the question is whether we use it, and the first system that comes to mind is the vascular system. So, you know, the heart obviously pumps the blood through large vessels, but when you get down to the small vessels, some of these small vessels are so tiny that they're actually smaller than the red blood cells that need to pass through. The blood resistance is created by that, and so I show here the red cells shown in the upper right, but if you look at this guy right here in the middle, uh, my pointer is not there, uh, having quite a lot of trouble. Even, even the other red blood cells, they don't retain the shape, they bend when they go through. So it's like trying to stick a soccer ball, football, through a narrow pipe, it takes a lot of energy. The question is whether our vascular system depends only on the heart or whether actually there's an assist. Now I'd like to suggest to you that there might be an assist from the radiant energy that's received. I wouldn't have said that or suggested it if not for our experiments which show a hollow tube just like the capillary and uh, we demonstrated that radiant energy or light drives the flow and so the question is might radiant energy help drive blood flow through your small blood vessels and uh, it's a hypothesis at the moment but an interesting um, an interesting finding published recently by an Israeli group they took mice and they killed the mice by clamping the aorta and the mice duly complied and died however these guys were using an optical technique to measure blood flow in capillaries and to their surprise and shock the blood flow continued for an hour beyond the time that the mouse died they repeated this ten times the ten mice and in each of the ten they got the same result blood flow continuing for at least one hour in every case they haven't got a clue what's driving this flow now, I'd like to suggest to you that it might have something to do with the radiant energy that's being absorbed all the time. So I think it's possible that we, we might actually use radiant energy in, in, I'm not suggesting that exactly that we photosynthesize, but the first step in photosynthesis, if you remember, is the splitting of water into negative and positive. That's no different from what I'm suggesting here. So we may actually capitalize on, on, on what has been invented to power plants. We may use the same mechanism ourselves. Now, going to um, to other medical health issues, one question which gets to the issue of friction is how come we can do deep knee bends um, or push-ups or whatever and our joints don't squeak? So our joints don't squeak, we're talking about ultra-low friction. So what causes friction? Friction is usually caused by so-called asperities uh, that, that stick out from, from flat surfaces. I can imagine two pieces of sandpaper rubbing on each other. Now, if you want to reduce the friction, you get rid of those as asperities or you separate the surfaces so that they don't intersect with each other. So you can imagine a, 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 a two substances like this rubbing on each other and one slides past the other, it's a lot of friction. However, if you take hydrophilic surfaces, and you have water in between, then you have something nice. You have an exclusion zone here, an exclusion zone here, with lots of protons here. If you get enough protons here, they <coughs> repel each other, pushing these two surfaces apart. And if the surfaces are pushed apart, then you have very little friction. And that applies uh, to your joints. So, for example, uh, this is a, a typical uh, joint structure. You have one bone pressing on another bone, ligaments here, and the bones don't touch each other, there are uh, cartilage, cartilage shown in the dark green here in the dark green. And cartilage is a gel, next to these two gels are exclusion zones, and in between the exclusion zones, uh, it looks something like this cartilage, cartilage, exclusion zones, and, and protons, and, uh, so you have a, a zone there 
have repelled each other. And people who have measured uh, these, these uh, joints demonstrate that even if you put a heavy load on the bone, the two ends don't touch each other. There's always a gap between. And nobody can understand why there would be a gap. And I think the gap is caused by the protons, which push the surfaces apart and make for very low friction. So I think the, the reason that we have low friction is because of this repulsive force that prevents any, that when there's shearing that's going on, it prevents the surfaces from touching. Now what about pathology? Uh, those of you who have sprained an ankle or broken, as I have multiple times, um, uh, notice that, in fact, the swelling occurs, and the current thought is that, well, the swelling occurs because the blood vessels are leaking blood, and, uh, and, and you get this, this swollen joint. However, it swells within seconds. It's really fast. And the question is, is it really leaky blood vessels that do this, or something else? And I think it may be something else. So if you look at the tissue in, in the ankle, uh, it consists mostly of connective tissue and muscle. So let's just look at muscle. So this is an example of uh, the inside of a the muscle. These are myofibrils running from here and here. And these are mitochondria. And this was taken by my colleague Charles Trombitash. We studied muscle for many years. And what I wanted to show you is that these are actually cross-linked. You can see there's a link here, there's a link here, and so on. And so if there's any attempt uh, for this muscle to expand or swell, can't do it because the cross-links are limiting the amount of expansion. And if you look inside one of these myofibrils with higher magnification, then you see the muscle filaments. So these are the standard muscle filaments. The dark ones are the thick filaments. And uh, there are no thin filaments here because we stretch the muscle uh, greatly. What I want to demonstrate here is these cross-links it looks like the rungs of a ladder connecting these uh, thick filaments together. So again, any attempt to swell is limited by these cross-links. Cross-links restrain. Now, if you sprain your ankle, uh, what happens to these cross-links between, between uh, these thick filaments that, that you see here is that they get broken. If they get broken, then it's possible with impunity to grow many easy layers next to each one of these filaments and it expands, and it expands greatly once you've done that. So there's no restraint to swelling. And I think the reason why this, why you get a, a swollen ankle is because, or a swollen joint, is, is that the e easy layers, which have a tendency to build to many, many layers, are no restraint. They just build and you get, and you get a swollen ankle. So I think the swelling arises from the build of numerous easy layers. Now what about cells? Inside of cells. So you can see the macromolecules, proteins, nucleic acids, and other molecules sitting inside. And uh, each one is surrounded by EZ. So the cells are full of EZ water. Now the cell that you see here has a, just a handful, a sprinkling of macromolecules. But in fact, the cell is really crowded, and it's really tightly packed, and most of the water inside is therefore easy water. It's so packed, this is an example of a, of a, a typical, in, inside of a typical cell, you can see all the molecules that sit here, and the, the water is shown here in this uh, darker color, um, a darker shading, and even the small molecules are omitted, so there's not much not much space between uh, the large molecules, and it's been calculated that the average surface-to-surface -surface distance is equal to only seven water molecules. So most of the cell water is easy water, just the way Gilbert Lane said most of the cell water is structured water. So the cells are full of negatively charged easy water. So now, if you think about um, the cell is full of this kind of water, and the cell has a negative electrical potential. It seems sort of self-evident that if you've got negatively charged molecules, you've got a bag of negatively charged molecules, then the electrical potential is going to be negative. That disagrees with the prevailing view. The prevailing view is that this negative charge inside the cell has to do with the membrane. I think it has to do with the easy water. And the evidence for that is if 
you stick the electro, the same electro into a gel, you get the same potential, roughly. And the gel has no membrane. So I think it's the water that's inside both the gel and the cell that confers the negative charge that we all well know about. So then the question arises, if you have six cells, and it's known that six cells have less negativity, you stick an electrode, for example, into a cancer cell, instead of getting minus 70 or minus 80 millivolts, it's minus 30, typically. So the question is whether six cells actually have less easy water. Now, easy water is critical for function if you think about protein folding. Everything the cell does, basically, is the folding of protein. But it's not a protein in isolation. The protein has easy water around it. And you can't separate the easy water from the protein. They act as one unit. So if the cell is deficient in easy water, it can't function the way it's designed to function. So as a test of this, we tried a few obvious agents, more coming. We tried aspirin. And uh, you know, aspirin restores function, gets rid of your headache, and gets rid of the swelling, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a multifunctional uh, drug. And so the question then is, does aspirin build EZs? Uh, and we found that it does. It's preliminary results. And uh, in low dose of aspirin, you can see that the exclusion zones uh, build sizably. And then from another tack, uh, more tests of the relevance of EZ for function. Think about anesthetics. So anesthetics block function. They block nerve impulses and uh, other sensations. And the question is, well, do anesthetics diminish the EZs? And these are results with mupivacaine and lidocaine, two common local anesthetics. And you can see that as the dose gets higher, the exclusion zone gets smaller. This is entirely reversible. So it looks like, and we, excuse me, we've done it with um, an, uh, fluorothane, an inhalation anesthetic, and got very similar uh, results. So it looks like the site of action is actually on water, as Linus Pauling had predicted many years ago. So we found that aspirin, which enhances function, builds EZs, and anesthetics, which impair function, diminish EZs. And I think that goes along with, with the idea that Easy water is really central for the function of the cell, as was suggested in the book that I wrote 12 years ago. So then you might ask, well, what about common therapeutics? You know, we use heat all the time. You walk out in the sun and you feel better. You, and you go into a sauna and you come out and you feel invigorated. So how, how, how would that work? Why are these therapeutic? And I think the answer to all of those is, well, you're getting infrared energy, and the infrared builds exclusion zones inside your cells. And building those exclusion zones are good for cell function, and therefore good for health. And then, now finally, I, I'd like to raise a question, a provocative question. Is your body charged? Uh, Takaraga Sensei will present a poster that actually shows experiments that demonstrate that your body is actually negatively charged. And while he was doing that simultaneously without knowing his experiments, I thought about, about doing the arithmetic. So your body consists of 60% cells, 60% of your volume, and the cells are negative. So it looks like you know, a large fraction of your body is negatively charged. <laughs> then you've got 15-20% extracellular space. That consists of negatively charged proteins and easy water mostly. So that's got to be negative too. So we're talking about you know, uh, three quarters of the volume of your body being negatively charged. Now where's the positive charge? Well, the places with pro protons are, for example, urine. Urine has a low pH, full of protons, and you get rid of it. Sweat. Sweat has a low pH, and you get rid of it. get rid of the protons. When you exhale, the carbon dioxide in the water gives you carbonic acid protons, and you get rid of it. So the suggestion from all of this and just doing the arithmetic is that is that it looks like your body is designed to get rid of positive charge and to maintain negative charge. And so I'd like to suggest the hypothesis that that your body strives for the highest possible negativity, and that high negativity is the essence of life. You 
you want to get as much negativity into your body as, as possible. Perhaps that's why alcohol and water does what it, what it does. And when you think about plants, well, they're negative too because the earth is negative and the plants are directly connected to the negative earth. So the plants have no, no difficulty maintaining their negativity. We have to work to maintain our negativity. And that gets to the issue of antioxidants. There are many antioxidants, and Vladimir has talked about them and, and such. And you know, I'd like to su suggest a possible, possibly simple uh, explanation that goes along the lines that, that Vladimir was talking about. If you think about reduction and oxidation, so reduction is the gain of electrons, and oxidation is the loss of electrons. We don't want to lose electrons. We need those electrons to maintain our negativity. So antioxidants should prevent the loss of electrons and therefore should maintain negativity. And negativity is, is uh, what we need to promote health. And uh, along those lines, of course, many of us have heard all about, and Jim Osmond is going to talk about, about grounding, walking on the surface of the grass barefoot or walking on, on the sand. We feel good when we do that or using a grounding sheet. And I think the reason we feel good is that the earth is negatively charged and can replace any negativity that we've lost. So maintaining negativity is really critical for this. And, and finally, um, I get to, um, some of you know Prahat uh, Jami, um, because there was a presentation in one of our meetings uh, two or three years ago about him. And the presentation was with a doctor who uh, had a group of physicians who examined this guy. So I mean, those of you who don't, don't know him, he claims to have survived in India living in a cave uh, with no food and no water for 65 years. Of course, nobody can prove that he's done it. But this group of physicians put him in the hospital, you can see here, for a couple of weeks, and it consisted of uh, pulmonologist, a urologist, a psychologist, what have you, from every conceivable discipline. They measured as many physiological variables as they could. They pronounced him normal. And yet, uh, he ate no food, drank no water during this time. And so, the uh, question is, well, you know, how, how does he do it? And by the way, the doctor who examined him, who was head of this group, claimed that this guy could run up a flight of stairs faster than he could. And this man eats nothing. So where does he get his energy? Um, well, a lot of uh, people, there was a book that came out four or five years ago called Life from Life about another person who eats almost nothing. And it's possible that the energy that is received by these people, in fact, does come from light. It also could come from water, for those who drink, because remember, if the water contains EZ, it contains separated charges, plus and minus. Separated charges are potential energy. So drinking the right amount of water gives you energy. So, I mean, this is one of the enigmas that remains to be resolved. So I conclude um, um, by saying, I, I present a lot to you, I know, I, perhaps a lot to digest, but I'd like to suggest that we learned that water has three phases, the solid, liquid, and vapor. And the evidence that I presented to you suggests a fourth phase. And this fourth phase, we call easy water, or, uh, uh, there are many possible names, exists between, it's somewhere between ice and water. In fact, we have evidence that if you want to freeze water, go from here to here, you must go through this phase. It's obligatory. And if you have ice and you melt the ice, you must go through this phase. It's also obligatory. So it's a kind of transition point between um, the ice and water. I presented to you that, that the idea that that a glass of water is absorbing at least visible energy, IR, and UV, and perhaps because of all of these, perhaps other energies that haven't been studied as much and need to be studied. And that building ECs and negative charge from radiant energy or other kinds of energy actually promotes health because you need that. And a lot of this stuff is, is in uh, the book that I wrote recently that some of you know. And to summarize 
for all of it, um, starting from the gradient energy absorption, I, I demonstrated to you that there are biological applications of easy water, of the energy that's used to build the easy water, that if what I presented to you is correct, it's really necessary to re-examine practically all chemical reactions and to understand them using different principles. I've also implied that that easy water, like, 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 and such, are really important for understanding weather. And I think that charge will turn out to be far more important than pressure and temperature, which are currently the variables that are used to predict weather. I presented to you some ideas about health and how easy water and negativity is absolutely central for your health and well-being. And in terms of food that you eat, well, if you think about it, if you eat these raw carrots, the carrots have cells. The cells are filled with easy water. If you eat the easy water, it may help you to replenish the easy water of negativity that exists in, in your body. There are also some applications like filtration, because if you can collect this easy water, it should be bacteria-free, uh, chemical-free, what have you, because it excludes. And possibly, it may also be possible to take ocean water and have that produce drinking water. But this is for the future. It's not certain that this can, uh, um, that this can happen, but we think it might. And finally, because you have separated positive and negative charge, it's possible that it may be useful to get electricity from water and from the sun. So I think I'll quit here.